Thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope everyone's having a great week so far. Um, so in this webinar presentation, we will be discussing guided bone regeneration, socket preservation. We're going to share a few different techniques on how to traumatically uh, extract teeth, uh, as well as a few of my cases. So before we begin, uh, I do need to disclose that I am a lecturer for Implant Direct. Therefore, I do have financial interest with Implant Direct that's offering financial support for this continued education webinar. Learning objectives, uh, we're going to be uh, discussing uh, ridge augmentation techniques, gain basic knowledge of the different bone grafts and selection, review the different armamentarium of surgical traumatic tooth extractions and techniques and devices. So when people come in to see you, they don't say they need a bone graft or titanium screw. They say they need a tooth or teeth. They want a nice smile and not feel self-conscious, or perhaps they just want to be able to chew properly again. About 40% of implants will require some kind of graft, whether GBR, guided tissue regeneration, or both. It's easier to preserve what's there already instead of rebuilding it. Today, it's not enough just to place implants where we think the bone is but rather an ideal location. It should be restoratively driven. Patients' expectations today are higher as well. Therefore, our standards must also be higher. So principles of osseous regeneration, um, osteogenesis, basically the formation of new bone by cells containing the graft. These are typically living cells. Examples are bone marrow. Uh, this is an active process and it's uh, the most desirable for grafting. The second one, osteoinduction. It's a chemical process by which molecules contained in the graft convert the neighboring cells into osteoblasts, which in turn form bone. Examples, demineralized bone matrix, BMP2, and platelets. This is also more of an active process. And the third, osteoconduction. Uh, it's a physical effect by which the matrix of the graft forms a scaffold that favors outside cells to penetrate the graft to form new bone. And the examples of these is uh, the ceramics and synthetic uh, um, uh, polymers and bioactive glass and TCP and HA. This is uh, more of a passive process. So for the uh, principle of guided bone regeneration, we want the graft to be stable. We don't want any micro movement. We want it to be immobile. Vascularity, to have those nutrients come in for regeneration. We want a good framework to support that graft to prevent it from collapsing. Cell exclusion, preventing the gingival fibroblasts and epithelial cells from um, invading into the uh, graft. And scaffolding occupation of space for the fibrin clot. There are a lot of different types of bone materials. We'll spend most of the time talking about allografts. And uh, if we have time, I will try to go back uh, to uh, speak about all the other ones. Autografts, it's a patient's own tissue. These are true osteogenic living cells, growth factors, no risk of disease transmission. You can harvest these from iliac crest, symphysis, ramus, and other areas too, such as the anterior nasal spine, buccal shelf, and tori. There's different allograft types too. You got cancellus. These particulates are more porous than cortical and resorb much faster. And then you got cortical mineralized. These particles should provide longer stability and space maintenance with slow resorption. And then you have the demineralized cortical. Um, these, uh, these have the uh, osteoinductive potential and releases BMP more readily. And you got cortical cancellus, basically the best of both properties. Block rafts. These in combination with collagen membrane and fixation pins have been shown to be superior than particulates with respect to the thickness and for a vertical uh, gain of a uh, hard tissue after six months of healing. The xenografts are a type of bone taken from a donor from another species. Uh, it's osteoconductive and provides bone stability. We got the thin uh, bone barrier. Uh, these come in different size and thicknesses. 
Um, I typically use them for repairing buckle walls. Uh, they're osteoconductive, uh, but some out there also have osteoinductive properties too. Uh, take, for instance, the one on the left. Uh, when it comes out of the package, it's hard like balsa wood. Um, when you place it in a defect area, uh, to repair a buckle wall, uh, once it's hydrated with blood, it does soften up, uh, making, uh, making it easier to adapt around the adjacent bony defect margins. Uh, there are also thicker ones out there, and even some made out of thin cortical bone in the market. Synthetic composite uh, plugs, uh, these go by different names depending on who you purchase them from. Uh, but one thing they all have in common, uh, they're, they're typically made up of about 80% calcium phosphate and about 20% of bovine tendon collagen. Uh, and they uh, expand once it's hydrated. There's another one out there that's kind of more of a sponge matrix um, cross-linked collagen uh, linked by uh, hydroxyapatite and a uh, sugar. Mialoplast, um, you got uh, tricalcium uh, phosphate and hydroxyapatite. These uh, promote osteoblast proliferation for new host bone formation, and they're typically combined with other graft materials to maintain space. And you got calcium sulfate. Uh, these resorb very quickly. And, uh, and we got bioglass. Uh, these are uh, synthetic uh, silica-based biomaterials with bone bonding uh, properties. Uh, these have um, a mechanical weakness, uh, but they're non-inflammatory, non-carcinogenic. And uh, this is another important instrument to have in your armamentarium, especially if you do GBRs. Uh, there's many out there in the market. Um, some are disposable. Others, you can switch out uh, the blades, similar to razors. Uh, my favorite that I use in my practice is the steel bone scraper. And we got growth factors. Uh, we're going to be uh, discussing uh, uh, briefly a uh, PRF, uh, just to make you aware of all the other ones that are out there. Again, if we have uh, time, um, I will go back to uh, discuss the other ones in detail. So PRF, it's a clot product with a whole blood sample that's placed in a test tube and spun in the centrifuge. Uh, this is a great service to offer your patients. Um, it can be used as a membrane, a plug, bone grafting, soft tissue grafting, and even root coverage. Uh, if you use it as a membrane, uh, it's typically compressed into a flatter membrane. It, um, I use it in my practice to cut it up into small pieces. I mix it with my allograft and I put it into my socket for my ridge preservation sites. Um, it helps with quicker soft tissue healing, um, good hemostasis, um, no need for anticoagulants when it's spun. Uh, it's just a, it's a great uh, product to use. So here... Um, you see, once the uh, spinning is complete, you take it out of the test tube, it's cut, you place a pre clot into a PRF metal container, uh, and you can buy these uh, PRF kits through your dental supply company. You cover it to flatten it for about two minutes, you remove, and then it's ready to use. Very simple. There are many different types of membranes in the market. Um, I've listed most of them here. Um, I'm going to be uh, speaking mostly about collagen membranes. So with these resorbable membranes, uh, they're typically made out of collagen. Uh, they show better uh, interaction with soft tissues, allow for a better oxygen uh, exchange, micronutrient pass favoring cell proliferation, and they typically come in uh, Achilles tendon, but then you got pericardium also made out of porcine. Uh, they can be uh, just regular uh, collagen membrane or they could be uh, cross-linked, uh, and those typically have a better mechanical stability, and they also have different resorption time. The advantages of resorbable membranes, um, less complication, uh, and they don't need to be exposed uh, to remove. Uh, disadvantage though, a poor mechanical property and uh, it's unpredictable with the degree of resorption. PTF non-resorbable membrane. These membranes were designed specifically for extraction site grafting and augmentation procedures where exposure to the oral cavity is common. Uh, it's resistant to bacterial invasion due to their small porosity. And uh, these membranes can be left uh, exposed in the mouth without much complication. I like using these a lot. So the advantages of this is uh, space maintain, uh, maintaining an occlusive yet allows cell migration. 
So it avoids a fibrous tissue formation um, disadvantage, a higher complication rate. And uh, this really um, occurs if, uh, let's say, uh, you put too much tension on the soft tissue, or uh, you know, since they're stiff too, they can sometimes poke through the tissue, uh, causing a perforation and exposure. So you got to be careful with that. Remember, membrane tacks and pins. There's different tacks and pins available in the market to secure your membranes. Um, I, I use the uh, membrane tacks on the upper left with the mallet. Uh, there's Profix also. Uh, that's a very good one to use. Uh, it's a lot more expensive, uh, but the advantage is you don't need to use a mallet and you don't need to drill any pilot holes. And if uh, you don't like to be retrieving your tax um, after the GBR is fully healed, uh, there's also one that resorbs on the lower left. And these uh, tend to start to break down after about eight weeks. Sutures, they provide tension on the wound margins to allow healing by primary intention, position and secure surgical flaps in order to promote optimal healing. There are different types of suture materials. PTF, monofilament, you got silk, nylon, polyproline, and on the resorbable side, you got uh, chromic gut, polyglycolic acid. These uh, absorb very slow, um, some, uh, as low as 56 days up to maybe 70. This, this I feel is an important suture technique to know and use, especially when suturing a span of several teeth or several sites. Uh, it's basically compressing and pulling the soft tissue together, moving the tension from the uh, incision area of the ridge and transferring it more apically. So when I use this technique, um, I basically pass, pass the needle slightly above the mucogingival junction, uh, followed by either interrupted or figure eight sutures. So sometimes even if there is a tension-free closure, if there's a heavy muscle pull, uh, it can also cause flap dehiscence and or failure of the graft. So you gotta be careful for, with that. Flap designs. Um, Typically want to do coronal positioning of the flap to cover the bone augmentation. There's different designs depending on the location. Uh, you typically want to advance the buckle. And uh, you, want to, um, you want to be able to flap that before you start your grafting. And on the lingual flap, you got to be careful reflecting, especially in the mandibular area because of the uh, vasculature. Uh, it can lead to bleeding and uh, other more serious issues. And uh, it's also challenging to do this uh, lingual flap on the uh, maxilla because of that thick uh, palatal tissue. So if you're trying to gain vertical soft tissue height to obtain primary closure in a GBR case, it's important to know how to release the soft tissue on both the buccal and lingual areas and the mandible. Uh, so one uh, technique is to release the lingual soft tissue called the finger sweep technique by Dr. Picos basically separating the deep mylohyoid muscle fibers without any sharp dissection, just with the use of the index finger. And um, I mean, you could get vertical gains of, uh, you know, 29 to 32 millimeters, which is great. And you can do uh, something similar on the buccal side um, uh, by scoring the perioosseum um, um, and to get that uh, flap tension free. So when you're planning a, to extract a tooth, it's always best to preserve as much bone as you can. I mean, sometimes that's not possible, but if you can remove it atraumatically, that would be optimal. So I'm gonna share some uh, instruments that I use to extract teeth atraumatically and a, a short video of it as well. Um, I typically start with my periosteal elevator uh, followed by two different size luxators, a two and a three millimeter, uh, which are thin short cutting edges that cut away the periodontal uh, ligaments uh, and followed by my apexo elevator. Uh, I start all my cases with these four instruments. And um, if they don't loosen, uh, then I use my surgical handpiece and section the tooth, especially multi-rooted teeth. I try not to cut the bone, I cut into the tooth. Uh, the mole curette to clean the socket. And I also use that uh, to inspect the facial plates and make sure there's no damage um, uh, during the extraction uh, or that the facial plate is missing.
So um, here I, I, uh, I had already started with Periosteo Elevator. Um, I'm skipping to the Luxator uh, just in the interest of time. Uh, so I'm starting with my two millimeter. I'm positioning it at the line angle. I'm turning a quarter turn and I'm maintaining that force for about five to six seconds. I am putting apical force. And please do not wedge a tooth against another tooth. You never want to put force against another tooth. So I repeat the same thing on the other line angle. Now I'm picking up my second luxator, the three millimeter, securing it on that line angle. Again, applying apical force, turning quarter turn into the, uh, into the tooth, into that canine. Repeat on the other side. You want to be patient with this. You don't want to rush it. After this, I'm going to pick up my last instrument, a Pexo elevator, and do the same thing. Apply the apical force. I turn about a quarter turn at the line angle. You can see the tooth already uh, becoming loose. It's already starting to come out. A lot of times, just with this elevator, I take the tooth out. But I don't even need the force up. already coming out. We'll stop there. So this is my instrument setup. Um, and I'd include any forceps. Uh, you could just use your favorite forceps. So next I'll be discussing a uh, socket shield. Um, the company that makes it's called Megagen. They go by different names, root membrane technique, socket shield technique, roots emergence technique, partial extraction therapy. And they even have two different kits that do almost the exact same thing. Uh, they were each designed by a different dentist. Um, I own the one on the left. So this root membrane technique uh, helps with preserving the hard and soft tissue. And I'll be sharing a case of mine next. So here we have Bobby. Here's a pre-op of eight, a healthy seven-year-old lady. Uh, she had fractured her tooth eight right down to the gingival margin. It simply wasn't restorable. So after reviewing the CT scan and listening to the patient's concern, we decided to use a socket shield technique here to minimize loss of and recession of the hard and soft facial tissue. So this is where I plan to put the implant. This is the kit that I use. I went through the sequence of burrs, starting with the first long diamond burr, going all the way through the canal, all the way down to the apex, and carefully uh, luxating it, and then removing the lingual part of the root, leaving the facial root attached to the facial plate. And then you, uh, towards the end, you can do a little bit of um, uh, prep work and, and, uh, and uh, adjusting the, uh, the edges, so that way it's beveled. So um, on the left, we got the immediate post-op and then a more recent four-year post-op and the uh, soft tissue is still stable. No recession, no bone loss. Uh, this is a, a, it's a good uh, technique to use. Um, there are other devices for a traumatic extraction of teeth out there in the market. Um, I'm going to be discussing two of them the piezo unit and the magnetic mallet. These are basically ultrasonic bone cutters. Uh, there's many brands out there. Uh, they're safe and predictable uh, with reduced risk of damaging nerve, arteries, or gingiva. They come with an LED light on the handpiece. 
And uh, there's so many indications for this. Uh, split ridge, harvesting bone, opening a, 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 a lateral uh, a window for a sinus lifts and many other uses. And we got the magnetic mallet. Uh, it's an atraumatic removal of teeth by means of a handpiece generating constant force. And with this, you hold it like a pen. It's delivering force and it compacts the bone. Uh, doesn't generate heat, uh, not very invasive either. Uh, has about four strength levels uh, that remains constant. And then with that constant force, that tip advances further, compressing the bone. Uh, I, I won't be showing you the video, but you guys can uh, check out the video on your own. Go to the website or even YouTube it. Uh, next, we're going to be discussing vertebrae. These birds are compatible with most implant systems out there. And, uh, you know, you can go to the website, download the, uh, the bird reference chart that corresponds to your implant system. It's an osteodensification procedure where it doesn't remove bone, but rather condenses it. And also just a lot of different uses for it. Um, so uh, with this, you, you start off with a pilot drill going in clockwise between 12 to 1500 RPM. And then after that, you switch to their osseo densification uh, burrs. Uh, you go in a millimeter, you pull out a millimeter, you go in another millimeter deeper, and it's more of a pumping action. And you want that, uh, you want, when you're drilling your last uh, 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 burr, uh, you want to go about a millimeter depth longer than the planned implant placement. Um, it's contraindicated to use with xenografts uh, for divergent molars are ideal to expand a septum. Um, it's just great. It really, um, you, you get a lot of uh, uh, bone uh, horizontal uh, gains with this. Okay, socket preservation. Here we have Christy. Uh, this patient presented with pain on tooth number three when she bit down. Uh, the endodontist wasn't confident that a root canal retreatment would be would uh, resolve her symptom. He suspected a root fracture, so would recommend that she have this tooth extracted. So the plan here was to extract the tooth, socket graft, and re-enter about four to five months to place an implant. So uh, the materials I use here was the uh, PDF uh, cytoplast membrane. Cortical cancellous allograph and 4.0 PTF sutures. When you're uh, grafting here, you don't want to pack too tightly. You want that blood vessels and osteoblasts to go into the defect promoting uh, angiogenesis. Here's the uh, three week post op. Um, if you see plaque on the membranes, nothing really to worry about. Granulation fills in. Here's the five week post op. It's healing nicely. Next case here, we have Karen. She presented with a failing implant number 19 that was causing her a lot of pain. She needed other work too, but this was her priority. Um, I apologize, I didn't have a pre-op intraoral picture, but I do have a post-op of it. So I removed the tooth and uh, this is her two week post-op of the extraction. Um, I had cleaned out the infection, um, all that granulation tissue, irrigated place allograft, cytoplast membrane and PTF sutures. And here's the four week. Tissue healed very well there. So at her four week post op, now she was complaining of extreme pain from tooth number 31. Uh, she was planning on having that removed back home because she's here part time. So uh, we set up to extract 31. So uh, I inserted my elevator between the forcation, I split the roots and I removed them. And the materials I use here, cortical cancellus, cytoplast membrane, and uh, polyproline uh, 4.0 sutures. You want to make sure you go with the uh, with your spoon excavator in there and really just clean out all that infected granulation tissue. You want to feel bone around all the sockets. Uh, and that way you're also inspecting that you have all the bones there. Um, the more bones you have, the more oxygenic potential. And you just irrigate with sterile saline. So what I do here, um, I typically um, put the cytoplast membrane first after I've uh, removed the tooth. 
I start loosening the soft tissue on the lingual and the buccal with my molt curette. Then I slip that cytoplasm membrane between the long, uh, the uh, lingual soft tissue and the bone. I try to tuck it in about three to four millimeters uh, minimum. And then I place the allograph mixed with sterile saline. And then I uh, close the socket by bringing that membrane over and, and tucking it in again uh, on the buccal side. Uh, this is a fairly predictable outcome with this technique. Easy procedure. Um, uh, for anyone to do um, after a few of these, it just it, it just gets easier and easier. Uh, it's also, I mean, it's a good service and a good revenue source for you, um, if, especially if you're starting out. Uh, this uh, has a high uh, predictability and uh, uh, at least complication, even if you're not placing implants. So this was her uh, pre-op of 31 and then her post-op. Same thing with 19. So I saw her for her two-week post-op of 31, and then uh, to the right, you got this now six-week post-op of 19. So that's all healing well, as expected. Um, with infection, if there's no, uh, if you have a non-resorbable membrane exposure um, and there's infection, the patient's complaining of uh, achiness and pain, uh, you want to irrigate the area. Place the patient on an antibiotic, such as Augmentum 875, BID for about seven days. Give them a chlorhexidine bottle and have them uh, clean the area uh, with a cotton swab to keep that membrane clean for about six weeks prior to removal. You're basically trying to salvage the graft that you have in there um, from it failing. You might still end up losing some. Complications related to the GBR. So the majority of complications, uh, you know, due to the incision line opening, exposure of the membrane, or infection of the graft materials, and that can lead to less bone regeneration. Um, you also have, uh, you know, uh, rapid degradation of the collagen membrane, especially if it's a, a collagen uh, membrane there. Um, once it's exposed to the oral cavity, I mean, it starts to uh, it starts to resorb almost immediately. Um, you want to also make sure that medical history was reviewed. Um, were they uh, on bisphosphonate? Are they smoker? Are they diabetic? And also um, examining, um, you know, um, your infection control, um, the handling of instruments and graft with possibly contaminated gloves. Causes of membrane failure. Uh, one is a uh, compression of the, of the prosthesis or maybe not releasing enough of the flap. In the beginning, it's a, uh, easy to be kind of shy and not really flap as much. And uh, that, 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 that works against you. You want to flap as much as possible. So that way you have a tension-free closure. GBR factors for success, got a good flap design, adequate blood supply, access to bone forming cells, tension-free closure, adequate suturing, and the size of membrane perforation, and barrier occlusion and stability. Okay, got our first GBR case here. We have Winnie. So Winnie, um, he had been wearing uh, cast partial dentures for the uh, uh, maxilla and the uh, mandible for many years. And uh, her ridge was very severely resorbed. I mean, both, both upper and lower. And, um, so what we did was uh, we took a CT scan to see where we're at. And I put the smallest diameter um, implant in there, a digital uh, implant, and um, you could see the implant sticking out of the bone. So um, I let her know we would have to stage this, have to do GBR, and then go back in about five to six months and see where we're at. I never overpromised the patient. I always let them know there's always a chance that we may need to do additional um, uh, bone augmentation. So what I did here um, after I um, did the flap with releasing incision, I mixed some uh, cortical cancellus and, uh, and also an autograph uh, from her, um, from the anterior nasal spine. In that area, that's my go-to. And I mixed the two together and uh, placed some collagen membranes and membrane tacks with my uh, bone scraper I used to, uh, to scrape the uh, anterior nasal spine. Here's a three-week post-op. And uh, just in the three-week post-op, you can see um, all the uh, horizontal gains and the keratinized tissue already filling in.
you could see already from the pre-op to the five-month post-op how much bone we gained there. So now she was ready for implants. Place the four implants. These were placed in uh, August 2018. And here's the five-year post-op. The bone is stable. No bone loss. So for my second case, um, wanted to stick with Winnie here. Um, so after five years, she's back now. She's ready to restore her mandibular missing teeth with implants and crowns. So this was taken March of this year. So the plan here was to remove uh, tooth number 20 and putting the three implants and then also placing an implant site 30. Uh, but we, you know, had the same issue like I did five years ago with her. Not enough bone. Very narrow ridges. So I uh, dropped a, a digital implant here, the narrowest that I can that I can place uh, uh, for each of these sites. And the bone, I mean, there's just not enough bone. She knew this already. So um, we uh, set her up for a GBR and staging this. Here's a pre-op photo. I made her an Essex prior to the surgery. To decortication. I like to do the decortication because it increases angiogenesis to the site. So if you do uh, a decortication, you definitely want to go beyond a millimeter until you get bleeding. Uh, you want to optimize that osteogenic potential uh, to the graft. I went ahead, decorticated the left and the right side. What we did here is um, I placed a membrane, I tacked it on one side, added the graft, uh, finished tacking into the other side. I actually used five tacks here, two on the left, two on the right, one on the bottom to secure the graft. Here was the post-op, the immediate post-op, tension-free closure. For the extraction site at 20, uh, I placed a collagen plug as a barrier, and I intentionally left some of the tissue and slightly open to gain more keratinized tissue that she was lacking. Here's a two-week post-op. That's uh, site 30. Here's the four-week post-op. In the five month post op. You can see how much bone we gain. So, just for reference, I use the same digital implant from the pre op planning and I dropped it here. And you can see the difference of how much more bone that you can add. Uh, I mean, a uh, much uh, wider a diameter implant that you can now place. And these were like 3.7 and a 3.2, 3.2 on the left, 3.7 diameter implant on the right. You want to give GBRs plenty of time to heal. I typically give it about five to six months. For vertical augmentations, closer to nine months. I always inform patients, like I said before, um, uh, you know, another surgery may be needed. I always tell them we're doing a preliminary graft and uh, more grafts may be needed. Again, pre-op and post-op of 19. And you can see um, how much uh, horizontal uh, bone gains we got on the right. Okay, we have uh, Greg. Greg presented um, with a mobile uh, teeth 7, 9, and 10. 
Um, he did not like to smile much. Uh, it would also hurt him when he chewed. He had been missing uh, tooth number eight for a while. And uh, he didn't want ortho and finances were limited. Here's an intraoral. So the plan here was to remove again, uh, tooth seven, nine, and 10. CBCT image. And you can see the bony defect at site eight. I'll show a different view next. There you can see the huge defect on the site uh, eight. So in this picture, um, I've already extracted uh, all three teeth, seven, nine, and 10. I flapped the facial soft tissue to prepare for the implant placement at site seven and 10. I flapped and reflected completely with releasing incisions for a better visualization of the anterior maxilla ridge to help with the orientation of osteotomy drills and uh, freehand placement of the implants and for bone augmentation. So in the picture on the left, I've already placed uh, implant number seven, getting ready to place implant 10. And on the second picture, um, I've added the allograph, I'm packing it in. And in the third picture, I'm placing the collagen membrane. So um, because of the amount of allograph uh, volume I added, I didn't wanna put tension and obtain primary closure. So I added, uh, I layered it with another non-resorbable membrane uh, there and a 4.0 polyproline sutures uh, with uh, both the horizontal mattress and interrupted uh, suture technique. And that was immediate uh, post-op. And that was about three months ago, a little over three months ago. Um, I typically have them come in for a one-week post-op, a two-week post-op uh, suture removal, and then about four weeks to remove the uh, non-resorbable membrane. There's a panel that I took of it. So at the, um, right before the surgery, um, he wanted to have implant 12 placed. So I said, okay. So we placed number 12 along with seven and 10. So this is uh, the uh, two week post-op, still healing. Um, I had made him an Essex for him to wear for about three months. Uh, I just saw him yesterday for about a three month uh, 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 evaluation, see how everything is uh, looking and uh, to get it to get it ready for a, um, a temporary fixed bridge. So that way we can begin shaping the papilla and scalping the uh, soft tissues and pontics. And here you can see the pre-op uh, defect at site eight and about three, three and a half months later um, after GBR, and with the implants in place. And um, you can see it's also a very uh, predictable procedure and with the uh, bone having filled in. That was the post-op back in uh, July. And everything looked great. Uh, there was no opening, um, soft tissue was closed. Uh, he did present with a couple of small allograft particulates that were superficial though, as you can see here with that small amount of bleeding. Doesn't make for a perfect picture, but um, it was all closed. Uh, I removed it, didn't have to anesthetize them. So we're gonna let that just uh, heal just a, a little bit longer. Okay. Uh, okay, for first one, uh, no, uh, this one is not. Uh, and I think I know what you're talking about. Um, there is a brand out there that that uh, does have the uh, uh, osteoinductive. Um, uh, this one uh, really isn't for the collagen plug. And uh, in this case, I didn't use the PRF um, uh, on, uh, on Greg. I'm assuming you're speaking about the, are you speaking about the last one, I think? Uh, I didn't use it for him, um, but I do use it uh, most of the time. I can use the root membrane technique. We only saw the kit on the screen. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I didn't I didn't have the, uh, the, uh, the film on that one. Uh, I... You, that one you can actually uh, you can go to the website and see the video on it. Um, I like I said for the uh, sake of time, I didn't I didn't have the uh, uh, the time to show the video on that. Um, 
the the screws um well th these were actually taxed i didn't use the screws uh for these cases and uh, no they're actually five millimeters uh they had they carry them in three the three i feel like it just doesn't do a good enough job to really uh grab hold of the bone uh they just don't they don't stay in they come out so i do use the five millimeter one and then once it's completed i'll do the flap and then i really just get the end of periosteal elevator and just pop them out uh, you just have to be careful though because the last thing you want is that going to the back of the throat and the patient swallowing so you want to um pack a, a throat pack on there four by four and really just be extra careful uh with that i do let the osteoblast just take care of the uh restoring the defect there yes uh, Nam, um, I, I sometimes tack, uh, the resorbent membranes for me, my rule of thumb is if I'm having to, uh, put a large membrane, uh, more than one site, I tend to use the mem uh, the, uh, I tend to tack if I'm just doing one site, um, I, you know, I just kind of slip that membrane in there. And, uh, you know, if I feel, I feel comfortable that it's secured in there just between the periosteum and the bone, um, you know, I, I leave it. So no, I don't tack in every situation. Uh, we, uh, I leave it in there typically for about four weeks, you know, but sometimes patients cancel their appointments and reschedule and end up being five or six weeks. Um, it's not the end of the world. I mean, the longer it's in there, the better, but then it becomes kind of a pain because now it's completely closed in. Now you have to make an incision and, and pull that membrane out. I like that for me, that four week is a nice sweet spot because the tissues haven't completely uh, covered or closed over the uh, membrane. And I just get my um, my Explorer and just gently tease it out. Um, no, well, that uh, that is that one's being treated also by the endodontist. We had that looked at. So, um, no, uh, we're not worried about that. But thank you for seeing that. <laughs> uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Unre. Um, how do I feel about using collagen plug as a membrane? Um, I use it for small sockets, um, for my anteriors, for my canines, uh, you know, my bicuspids too. Um, I'll use it. I won't, I won't use it for my molars. I think it just resorbs too quick and uh, uh, you, you, you're exposed to more complications with that. I mean, for me, it just takes an extra two minutes to just put a uh, cytoplasm membrane in there, non-resorbable, and it heals fine. But yes, for certain cases, I do use uh, that that short video uh, that I showed in the beginning of uh, the extraction of tooth six. I use a collagen plug. They heal nicely. No issues. Uh, Jennifer, I get my membrane tax from uh, Salvin, Salvin Dental, and they also sell the screws too, the Profix. For the uh, Diego, um, for the socket preservation, what kind of bone graft do you mostly use? I use cortical cancellas. Um, I have both mineralized and demineralized. The mineralized is just, it's, it's a little harder. And I think it, it takes slightly a little bit longer um, for that to turn over. Um, I use both. Um, but my go-to lately has been a bit more of the mineralized, but, but always, uh, I use 50-50, cortical cancellas. Uh, but uh, for like larger sites that need a lot more uh, longer healing, uh, sometimes I'll just use mineral uh, mineralize uh, cortical cancellus. So I hope I've answered uh, your question. Um, I think okay. So Raj's uh, socket shield technique and something on xenograph. Um, I okay for my xenographs. I um, I know some people are for it, some people are against it. Um, I. I use my xenograft for my uh, sinus lifts. Uh, for my sinus lifts, I do my lateral sinus lifts. I do mix the xenograft with uh, with allografts. I don't typically use it for my GBRs. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, I mean, a xenograft is one of the most studied uh, biomaterials out there. Um, nothing wrong with it. Um, I just like to see it turn over to um, you know to natural bone. Uh, so that's just my preference. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, Nora, it is, it is controlled and we're keeping an eye on a few other teeth. Um, but yes, uh, it's still in progress. Uh, again, it was, uh, you know, he was having pain and having these loose teeth that needed to come out. We treated that, 
but we have done comprehensive uh, uh, treatment on him since, and he is uh, um, on uh, SRPs. Thank you for uh, pointing that out. Uh, Josh, uh, you're asking, when doing a simple socket preservation, if there was a smaller fenestration or even larger defects with an intact periosteal membrane, flapless extraction, would you place a non-resorbable membrane? Um, yeah, yeah, I would. Michael Shin, um, on narrow ridge augmentation around the lower molar, do you augment both the buccal and lingual, only buccal? Um, I, I do buccal. It's just, it's extremely hard to do this on a lingual. So I do it on a buccal, uh, decortication, uh, to get that bleeding. And then it's just easier access. And it's just easier to just build it that way. I mean, from the lingual, no, I, uh, I, I don't do that. Are there times when you would bone graft without a membrane or collagen plug? Is it bad to have bone stuck in the tissue? Um, I mean, the only time I really see that if Let's say you have a patient who's not a very good healer. They probably have some other uh, core morbidities and um, you go in there even at five months, six months, and you find some um, bone particulates stuck to the soft tissue when you've done the flap. That's happened. That's happened to me. So I hope I've answered your question. And regarding the bone graft uh, without membrane and collagen plug, yeah, you don't necessarily always have to use um, a, a membrane or collagen plug, um, but I think what's more important is to use a membrane and collagen plug and not necessarily always use a bone graft. Like, let's say, for instance, you got um, an extraction with immediate implant placement, right? Uh, let's say, uh, let's pick a, a tooth uh, eight or nine. You take out tooth eight or nine, you put the implant in, and you have maybe about two millimeters or less between the surface of that implant and the facial plate, you don't necessarily need to put bone graft in there. As long as that jumping distance, and there's a literature on this too, if the jumping distance is less than the, about uh, two millimeters, it, it, just, it just forms. You don't need to worry about that. Dr. Twin, uh, do you ever use tissue glue over collagen membrane to create another barrier for graft loss? Um, not anymore. I used to use uh, uh, the tissue glue. Um, I, I, I don't. I don't anymore. Um, I really just. I try to keep it simple. Uh, simple on my staff. Simple on myself. Uh, if I just start adding so many things out there uh, uh, at the uh, on the, uh, you know, on the table, <laughs> would never get out. I do use osteogen plug as a graft material. Yes, especially for uh, my denture patients. And let's say they're not wanting to have implants. Uh, it, it's great. Uh, great for a uh, ridge preservation. Uh, we, I have used titanium reinforced membrane during GBR. Um, uh, those, uh, I mean, it's pretty, for me, in my hands, um, it, my results are pretty predictable for horizontal gains. For vertical, yes, I will use titanium reinforced uh, membrane. Well, uh, this concludes the webinar on guided bone regeneration and socket preservation. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, have a good night.